All right, just making sure our folks over on Facebook can hear us also. Okay, it's 12 o'clock. Um, we've got some attendees that are popping in here um, as we speak. Um, and we'll just allow the, the rest of the folks to come in as they can and we'll get started. So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Gardening in the Panhandle Live. I believe this is our fifth. Can't remember, it's been so much fun. Uh, today, we're gonna be talking about prepping for the fall garden. And we've got a really nice group of panelists here for you. Um, I'll let them introduce themselves in just a second, but a uh, quick introduction by me will be Molly Jamison, Danielle Sprague, um, and Matt Lawler. And behind the scenes, as usual, we have Julie McConnell um, running Facebook and some behind the scenes stuff. Beth Bowles is going to be managing uh, some of the links that we'll send out in our chat. And we've got Matthew Orwat managing uh, questions over on Facebook. Uh, so we've got a really good group for you today, and we're excited to get all of your questions answered. Uh, appreciate everyone who sent us in questions from Zoom. Those of you on watching via Facebook, if you'd like to have uh, next time your, your questions read aloud to make sure you get them read, uh, go ahead and register for the program uh, via the Zoom link. Um, and that if you do that way, you can ensure questions will be read. So now we'll get to our introduction. So we'll start with the one that's top on my screen here. Molly, tell us a little bit about yourselves before we get going. Sure, I am in Leon County and I'm sustainable agriculture and food systems agent here. And so I do a lot of vegetable gardening, and a lot of workshops on uh, recycling food waste and composting and that kind of thing. Awesome. Yeah, the over in Leon County, they've got an incredible garden. If you've never been to their extension office, once we get things lifted a little bit here from COVID, be sure and go visit. I'm sure Molly or Mark over there would be happy to give you a tour. Uh, they and the veg heads do a great job with that. So she's going to be able to share a lot, a lot of wisdom with us, no doubt. Uh, we'll keep going down the list here. Um, Danielle, why don't you introduce yourself to the group? I believe this is the first time you've been on a Gardening in the Panhandle Live. That's right. So um, hello, everybody. My name is Danielle Sprague, and I'm the Agriculture and Natural Resources Extension Agent um, in Jefferson County, uh, Monticello. Um, so I do a lot of work with um, a lot of the farmers in our county here. Um, but it's great to be here today on Gardening in the Panhandle Live. Awesome. Yeah, Danielle's kind of positions fairly similar to mine. We're we have horticulture responsibilities, gardening, residential horticulture responsibilities, but we also have ag responsibility. So uh, you'll forgive Danielle uh, if she's been out in the cotton field uh, and that's where her mind is. We're, we're trying to get reprogrammed to gardening, but we, we wear a lot of hats in all counties, that's for sure. Uh, moving down the list, Matt Lawler, a repeat customer here. Matt, just give us a quick introduction. I'm sure all of these folks have seen your smiling face before. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Daniel. Uh, Matt Lawler. I'm the commercial horticulture agent in Santa Rosa County. So my primary clientele are fruits, fruit and vegetable producers, um, usually on the smaller acreage side. Yep. So Matt, what Matt does is going to fit right in with us today. Uh, as you can see, we've got a really good group uh, for y'all today. Of course, my name is Daniel Leonard. I'm the uh, co residential and commercial horticulture agent will be the hat that I'm wearing today in Calhoun County. Um, so I'm right here in the center of the panhandle. So we've got folks, all Matt's all the way out in the west, almost in Alabama. Um, and Molly and Danielle are as far east as you can go in our district in Leon and Jefferson County. And I'm right here in the middle. So we've got the whole panhandle covered for you today. Um, so let's get into our questions. Uh, without any further ado, we're going to start with some, uh, start with the basics. So if you can't get your, if you don't have your soil right, none of the rest of this is going to work either. So we're going to talk a little bit about soil prep. We've got a couple of questions related to this. Um, Matt, uh, we've got a question from Zoom. The, this person asked, I'm clearing some overgrown yard for a new garden. What do I need to do to prep the soil for my fall garden? Should she do anything to it or just plant right into it as it is? What do you think? Okay, so in this case where something's been fallow or if you've got a, a wooded lot that you've recently cleared, um, you know, you're most likely going to need to, well, first of all, get rid of any stumps and old roots and things, um, and then get a good uh, till, deep till on the soil, just to try to get everything 
prepared for your fall vegetable garden. Um, we've got a, a link that we'll post that talks about soil preparation and, and liming. Um, so that's another important thing that you'll need to do is go ahead and take some soil samples and um, send those in to the University of Florida or if your local extension office does pH testing, you could do it that way too. Um, and uh, go ahead and see where your pH is um, and, and what kind of nutrients you already have in the soil. Uh, depending on where you are in the pan, you know, you might already have some uh, adequate level of phosphorus. Um, and just depending on the pH, depends on whether that's going to be available or not. Very good. So um, sounds like everybody, uh, if you've got a, a garden that hadn't been worked in a while, or maybe you've moved garden spots and you're, you're breaking some new ground, first thing we want to do is get a soil test, right, Matt? Yep. Yeah. As long as you get most of the, the larger pieces of uh, wood and roots and things out of, out of that area. Yeah. Uh, even for the best of us that have been gardening for a long time, there's, you can't look at the soil and tell what's in it. So getting that soil test is always the first thing you need to do. That's awesome, Matt. Thanks. Uh, Danielle, uh, Danielle uh, has a, a good amount of commercial fruit uh, in her county, uh, especially citrus. Um, and so this question is kind of pertinent to you. Uh, so Danielle, the person asked the soil, I would like to solarize. And we'll let you explain a little bit to those of us who may not know what solarizing is. Is close to blueberry bushes and citrus trees. Can I solarize? Um, and if so, is there a certain distance away from my blueberries and citrus trees that I should be? Okay, so thank you, Daniel. Um, so basically, solarization is the process of um, heating up the soil. And the idea behind this is um, you're getting the soil hot enough um, to kill any you know, weeds or nematodes, um, pests in the soil. Um, and so the idea behind that is you want to get the soil very hot um, and now is the time to be doing that. Um, in terms of how close to um, the shrubs or trees, um, obviously you don't want um, the area you are going to solarize uh, to be shaded. And so um, basically what you do for solarization is you would essentially um, till up the soil or prep the soil and then um, use a clear plastic uh, sheet over the soil to heat it up. And that's what you're using to get um, the soil hot enough. And um, so basically you don't want to be you don't want that area to be shaded. So if you can solarize that area and it's close to the blueberry bushes and the citrus, um, but not shaded, then I think you should be okay. I don't know that there's a certain distance that you need to be away from the trees. The biggest thing is you just don't want the, the trees to shade that area. You want the sun, you want full sun. Um, so it sounds to me like you're saying that, um, you should be okay to solarize as long as you're out of the drip line of the, the citrus trees. That's right. That's so, right. No solarization under the camp. That's where I, the majority of our roots, I guess, are going to be on our citrus. So. Plus the solarization is not going to work in the shade anyway. Right. It's going to be shaded. So it's not yeah. going to get that area hot enough. Gotcha. So it sounds like as long as you're not uh, under the tree, in the drip line where you're, you can't solarize anyway, you're going to be okay on that one. So thank you, Danielle. That's awesome. Um, Matt Lawler, there's a lot of um, interest nowadays about no-till farming, no-till gardening. Um, so we'll come with this age-old question. Is tilling recommended? What do you think? Okay. Uh, well, that first scenario we had where it um, sounded like somebody was clearing a lot um, I did recommend tilling just right. because uh, it was a fallow ground um, It just sat there, sounded like it sat there for a while and uh, which kind of needed a clean start. Um, whether or not to till in an area where you've been gardening um, is kind of up to where you want to go with your garden. Um, so, you know, some people might bring in some mushroom compost or other compost materials um, in that case, it would be important to kind of till that in at least, you know, four inches or so just to kind of get a good, good mix with your, your native soil. Uh, but in some cases, people like to uh, use cover crops uh, for, for their garden. Um, so and what I mean by cover crops would be something that you would plant in the off season 
um, and you could you could either till that into the soil before you plant your fall vegetable garden and, and add some nutrients to the soil that way or some people will go in and they'll just kind of cut in their rows into that uh, cover crop and um, and plant within that and just kind of mash or, or flatten everything down um, where they're, they're not planting. So they're, they're actually using that cover crop as, as a weed barrier. Um, and then in addition to that, if, if, you're, if you're going that no-till route, uh, some people will even plant in um, some uh, what they call like a green mulch. So between their rows, they'll, they'll plant something uh, such as a clover, um, there's uh, some buckwheat, there's another uh, number of, of different things that you can plant that are lower growing and that'll add some, some nutrients to the soil either before you plant or um, while, while you've got a crop in. Uh, the other advantage to those, some of those green manure uh, crops or, or green compost crops would be um, that, that they're, they're usually gonna be some kind of flowering or quick to flower crop. Uh, they might bring in some additional pollinators and some other beneficial insects. So um, I th think we've got a, a publication that we posted that kind of talks about why to till and when to till and, and things like that. So, so once again, uh, it's kind of a, it depends answer. Yeah, that one was a very complicated one, and that and that depends on on what route you're going. I know a lot of organic farmers and people that want to grow their home vegetable crops organically. Um, they might not want to till as much um, just because uh, they're they're looking at more of long term uh, nutrient levels in their in their soil and, and trying to trying to add nutrients without using some of the commercial fertilizers that are available. Gotcha. One, one thing I would add to, to that is that you, you know, if you're, say you do solarize and then you take off that plastic sheet, you don't want to till at that point because, you know, the solarizing only actually heats up the top layers of soil. And so if you till, you're going to be getting those different seeds that are deeper in the seed bed up to the surface. And then you'll have weeds that the, the seeds germinated that didn't get tilled by the heat. So just kind of keep that in mind. You know, you don't want to till after you've solarized. Yeah, that's good. It connects the previous question to this one. So Molly, what do you, um, what do the veg heads do in their garden? Or is it a kind of a hybrid, a mixture of till some and, and no till where they can? Um, a lot of what they do is a lot of sheet mulching. Um, so they'll take cardboard and then oak leaves and then just do lots of layers of mulch that help to keep down the weeds and then it decomposes over time, adds organic matter to the soil. And then they also use cover crops, um, as Matt mentioned, a lot of summer and winter cover crops. Gotcha. So it's possible to no-till, but there's a lot of gardeners who are very successful tilling. It just kind of depends on your personal preferences and your operation more or less. So awesome, very thorough, as we can expect from you too. Uh, Molly, since, you, since you're right here, we're going to come right back to you. We're going to talk, uh, spend a little bit of time on uh, cool season gardening, fall gardening timing here. Um, and this is a question that I've had before, uh, the common question. Molly, do we need to let our raised beds, quote unquote, rest um, before planting a fall garden? So do we need to remove all that spring and summer plantings and just kind of let it sit? Or can we just more or less go right into the fall garden? Uh, so yeah, you can more or less just go right into it. Um, the, the big thing is say you do have some of your old debris from your summer garden, uh, tomatoes at this point, all, all of that should be removed because they can harm a lot of different diseases uh, amongst yeah. the foliage. Yeah. And so it would be a good idea to go ahead and clean that up. If you do have a bare soil right now, you know, the big thing is if you get a lot of rain, you're gonna have a lot of erosion, which is not gonna be a very good thing. It'll kind of break down that soil. Yeah. Um, and so, but that said, you don't have to give any kind of fallow period in between growing. Um, it's just more important to rotate your crops, you know, don't be growing the same plant families, you know, back to back. Um, so that kind of thing. But as far as having to put any rest period, you do not have to do that. And matter of fact, that could just lead to, you know, allowing more weed seeds to come up. And so having something there that's green is going to be better for your soil in the long run. So we've talked about fallow a couple of times. Will you explain to our pan, uh, our attendees who may not know what fallow, what are we talking about there? Uh, really just bare soil. 
Um, so okay. it has no protection from, from any, any of the rain that's gonna come down or any wind. Um, one thing you do wanna do, of course, is add some kind of nutrients back into the soil. Because when you harvested those spring and summer crops, what you took out of the soil, of course, is the nutrients that are in your food. And so you do wanna make sure that you have all that nutrients put back into your soil, whether it's through it's a, you know, a 10, 10, 10 or NPK type of fertilizer or just compost that you're adding to the soil. Gotcha. So if I've got a raised bed that had tomatoes in it um, and I'm, I'm ready to pull them up, they've about quit and I'm not gonna plant anything until you know I get ready to put my cool season stuff in in a few months. I can just either let it sit, plant a, a little, a quick cover crop on it or something like that. Yeah, I actually have some iron clay pea uh, planted in my raised beds right now. They're starting to okay. come up. And so that's giving me some, some coverage because it's hot outside and I yeah. don't want to be out there really. So I'd rather just cover up my soil with the, the peas, let them grow. Once they flower, I'll cut off the, the tops of that and then just let it sit. And that's going to add a little bit of nitrogen to my soil and keep it covered and, and safe from erosion and, and okay. keep it pressed. Awesome. All right, Matt Lawler, um, this is a, you know, a, real, a real basic question, but it's important and um, it's kind of, uh, kind of nuanced, I would say. Um, so how long is the fall vegetable gardening season or vegetable growing season? Okay, uh, so uh, we're gonna post a link to our Florida Vegetable Gardening Guide. And so that's probably one of our most visited uh, links on the internet when it comes to the University of Florida. Uh, and it's got a chart on there of what to plant when, um, and it's got it organized uh, or categorized either as North Florida, Central Florida, or South Florida. So um, for most of our viewers, we'll stick with the, the North Florida uh, listing of what to plant when. Um, and as far as how long is the season, you know, we're going to start something like tomatoes uh, in, in August, uh, putting, putting transplants in the ground, um, you know, August, September ish. Um, and then, you know, we can look on there for beets and you, you might plant a beet seed in August. You might try some more, uh, in November. Um, and you can go all the way into almost February with those, those beet seeds. So, um, so when it comes to length, I mean, you, <laughs> I guess I guess what we're thinking about, and we've talked about uh, cover crops and um, when to till and what to till. You're pretty much gardening all 12 months out of the year, whether you know it or not. Um, and uh, you know, depending on what kind of crops you plan to grow in the, the fall, uh, just kind of depends on how long that season's gonna last for you. Gotcha. So so you're kind of saying that you you have two choices really, or really three. You can do a second summer garden really sure you can wait until the cool season garden or you could do both right yeah i mean i just i just think about it as, as garden all you know 365 yeah. days a year right okay very good uh, we had several questions that were kind of related to this um matt and we'll stick with you for this i've had such bad luck with my fall garden and just for the sake of the discussion here we're going to assume she means the, the actual cool season plants uh greens and uh, stuff like that. Had to mm -hmm. put with my fall vegetable garden that I was thinking of moving veggies back two weeks this year. So what are, what would be your thoughts on that getting a little bit later start than what's recommended? Yeah, uh, so you know something like tomatoes we're going to probably pretty much stick with the same planting dates year after year uh, just because they are a longer term crop um, so they might be 100 days yeah. or something before you get a tomato. Uh, but you, you know you brought up a good point with the uh, greens and, and different lettuces um something like that i don't i don't see a problem with you know waiting a couple more weeks especially i mean we've had i mean it's been hot all, all summer long consistently yeah. uh, we hadn't had much of a break we're getting a little more rain and, and cooler days this week but other than that we hadn't had much of a break so. yeah i mean you can you can plant some of those crops and they germinate real quick you know like lettuce and some of the greens and you can do that in late august and september like you're sort of supposed to in some cases and it's just too hot and they don't perform so so you're saying right. I'm back a little bit depending on the year may not be the worst thing in the world no and i mean it, you talk to any farmer it's always a gamble so i mean they, they're always <laughs> moving moving dates around uh, mainly because of weather patterns and, and that sort of thing but yeah uh, you know, the Florida Vegetable Gardening Guide is is just that. It's a guide, uh, you know, 
it's not it's not a hard and fast rule just adjust based on the year um so kind of in concert with that matt uh, when would be the best time to plant the cool weather plants? We touched on it a little bit, but in your opinion, when would you like to get those seeds in the ground? Um, so, so again, that goes just back to our guide. Um, you know, you're going to start a lot of stuff in uh, late August or uh, early September. Um, and I guess the, the important thing there as to when to start what, it's always a good idea to kind of stagger your plantings of uh, any of the same crops. So, uh, you know, you're planting every week, uh, you know, for three weeks or so you might, you might plant tomatoes, uh, you know, three tomatoes at a time instead of planting all, all nine over the course of those three weeks uh, at one time. Um, so kind of staggering your plantings, that way you're staggered, your store of vegetables, um, and you're also kind of spreading your risk out a little bit better. Gotcha. Yeah, I've made the mistake of planting more or less all of my spinach and lettuce at one time, and I'm just overwhelmed by the amount that I get at one time, and then it's relatively quickly, so that's a good point. Good point there. All right, Molly, we're going to switch gears a tad and kind of hone in on what Matt was talking about with these warm season veggies. A lot of folks don't know, um, you know, in Florida, our growing season's so long, and, it, and the summers just get so harsh that a lot of our spring planted warm season veggies just kind of, you know, peter out in the middle of the summer. So can we grow those again? So the question here, can zucchini be planted again for fall? Um, yeah, so it's, you know, one thing to think about is uh, all of our warm season crops, you know, that really just means that they can't take uh, cold weather. So depending on the crop, um, you know, they can't maybe take frost or freezes or hard freezes. So anything that can't take a, a, a frost really does need to be planted far enough ahead of time so that you'll be able to have a full crop before we have our first frost. So here in North Florida, you know, we're in zone 8B and uh, it means we have about a 50% chance of a frost near the beginning of November. Um, so something like zucchini really can't take um, any cold weather at all. You're gonna wanna count backwards. So let's say you have a, a crop um, zucchini takes, you know, at least two months, I would say, to get a, a, yeah. a crop. And so you'd say you have that 60 day period. Well, if you, if you don't, if you can't take frost, you count backwards. So the beginning of November, go backwards two months. That's put us at the beginning of September. And then another thing to consider is as we get into the winter, our day, our day length is decreasing. Our weather is getting colder. So our crops aren't growing quite as fast. And so I like to also add about another two weeks of time to that, that table. So that puts you at the big middle of August. So if you don't get that zucchini planted in the ground by then, we, you know, you risk um, running into a frost before you get any actual fruit. Um, now that said, we might not actually get a frost until the end of November. Um, right. you know, we've had, I think three years now, we've had like record hot Septembers. So even I, I'm starting to tell folks to, to, wait, to wait a little bit before they get their fall garden going because we just had it so hot in the, in the late summer. Gotcha. That's true. So it can be done, but uh, you need to do your homework, it sounds like. And squash vine borers are still around. So they, they tend to have two, two cycles through the season. Yeah. So we have a lot of mature squash vine borers that would just love to, to lay some seed, <laughs> some, yeah. some eggs, excuse me, right by your zucchini. Yeah, so that's nice. So uh, be on the lookout for insects and do your homework on the days uh, for sure before you before you go to plant your fall garden. So Matt, um, if we're planning to get a uh, pole beans, uh, another crop in the ground, will they, uh, or if we've got some in the ground that are still going, will they stop producing when the nighttime temperatures get too high, similar to tomatoes? Will they stop setting fruit? Uh, yes, uh, similar to tomatoes and some of our other crops. Uh, they will stop, uh, you know, the, their flower, they'll flower and then the flowers will just fall off on you. Okay. Um, that, that's not the only reason that the flowers might be falling off or you might not be setting a, a crop, uh, but it could be, you know, extra cloudy days or uh, poor pollination um, of, of the peas themselves. Um, or uh, some instances it might be too much water uh, staying on the crop. Um, you know, in the, during the nighttime. So too wet of soil throughout the gotcha. night. 
uh, posted uh, a publication from New Mexico State, and um, it kind of goes over some reasons that your peas might not grow. Um, another thing to think about, though, uh, sometimes you can get a second crop of, of peas. You can you can almost cut them, just cut the plants in half, and, and they'll start they'll start producing leaves and, and flowering again. So. That's a good point. I've actually done that before. Just more or less take the head shears to them, and and you know just cut them down and let them regrow. So I have successful with that. I'm not the greatest gardener, but I have done that once. <laughs> Good. But uh, so like tomatoes, when it when you're getting what is the what's the temperature cut off? It remind me, is it 80, something like that? Yeah, 75, 80. Um, and those are and, nighttime temperatures, correct? Right. And I, I just had another thought. There are some um, other completely different species of, of similar to green bean crops, like uh, the yard long beans uh, mm -hmm. that can handle some more heat. Okay. Um, and, and they're a great crop to utilize if you've got uh, something for them to climb on. Uh, they could just, gotcha. you, you got a really long bean and you just cut it into little pieces and you got green beans again. So. Very good. So when it gets hot, look to some of those uh, more heat tolerant bean varieties. That's awesome. Uh, Molly, uh, we'll come back to you. Danielle, I promise we're going to get to you in a minute. I'm giving you, giving you a little break here. Uh, Molly, can you grow field peas in the fall? And for, for everybody out there, we had a long, intense intellectual discussion on the difference between peas and beans. And maybe Molly can get into that a little bit. But Molly, the main question here is, can you grow field peas in the fall? Um, yeah, so it, it, it's kind of similar to the last question and that, you know, field peas are, are, they really can't take any cold weather. Um, yeah. So again, you just want to count backwards uh, and make sure you're giving yourself enough time, um, you know, before we get into the cooler, the cooler weather. Um, so the field peas, you know, the, the black eyed peas and, and that kind of thing are, are, do take, um, I mean, again, what, at least 60 days, it really depends on the variety. Some, some are longer, some are like 75, 80 days. And so right. try to go with one of the, the shorter uh, day varieties and then just do some math and you can, you can get another planting in. That's one great thing about where we live. Yeah, it's tw like Matt said earlier, it's really 12 month gardening in Florida. Double-edged so, sword, but. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We got a lot more pests and diseases, but we've got a lot more time to combat them. So, cause we can garden more or less year round. So that's cool. Um, this is a very related question. We've got a lot similar to this. Um, and so I'm gonna let you cover, we've, we've, you've talked about this pretty much ad nauseum. So you can cover it as quickly as you want. When do we plant seeds for the fall garden? Should they be started now and then transplanted into the garden when it cools off? What's your thoughts on transplanting versus direct seeding maybe? Yeah, um, so I like to direct seed uh, basically all root crops. You know, they have real sensitive roots and they don't like to be disturbed. Um, onions maybe being the exception, but you know, carrots, uh, uh, radishes, turnips, you know, you want to direct seed all of those crops. And then I like to start indoors uh, more of my long-term crops. So let's say kale, uh, collards, um, broccoli, you know, the, the plants that you're going to be harvesting from the same plant throughout the season. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's better to go ahead and give those like a head start, especially if you're starting from seed. Um, now that said, it can be a little bit difficult. You know, August, September, it can be really hot. Um, the temperatures are usually too high for really good seed germination. Um, so you do wanna have, you know, afternoon shade, maybe use some shade cloth if you have a seed bed. Um, or uh, if, you, if you're willing, take it indoors and use some, some fluorescent um, or LED grow lights. Um, you set up a little plant nursery in one of your, your side rooms, then you're, you, know, you have it under AC. And if you really like growing from seed or want to grow some varieties that you can't find at the store, mm -hmm. um, that's a great way to get started in, the, in the August and September. Um, okay. Awesome. So that's a pretty good discussion on should you start your seeds or should you grow transplants and when you should do it. So that's good. We've got a bunch of variations on this next question. Um, and sort of, I mean, we've got the best vegetables to plant in our area. Um, you know, what are North Florida successful vegetables? Uh, so we've got three or four that are very similar to that. So instead of going through all of them, um, I just want each of our panelists to give me you know, one or two vegetables, uh, you know, cool season vegetables, or even these later warm season vegetables that they've been really successful with and just enjoy growing. Um, 
maybe something that or you're, you might not be quite as familiar with. So we'll start with Molly. I know she's she grows a variety of stuff. So let's hear from you first. Yeah, that's a tough question. Um, yeah. Fall is definitely my favorite time to grow. Um, I mean, even though all the summer spring crops are, are fruit crops, you know, and they, they are also fun to grow. Um, I really like to grow uh, some dinosaur kale. Um, it's, it tastes really good. You know, kale is yeah, just yeah. gonna be so easy. You can just keep harvesting those lower leaves. And, you know, as long as you don't have any big major pest problems, um, it goes, you know, you can be still harvesting into March and April. Onions, you know, if you put out sets, um, you want to do short day onions, plant them in the fall. Onions are my favorite food. So, uh, <laughs> you know, maybe they're not the easiest to grow, um, but if you pick the right varieties and you plant them at the right time, um, I'd yeah. say give onions a, a try, or at least bunching onions. They're, they're, they are easier to grow. There has never been a dish that onions didn't improve, I don't think. I agree. Very few, <laughs> yes. Uh, Danielle, give us one that you, you enjoy growing. I really, really like arugula. Um, oh. <laughs> I love, well, I just love arugula. So I okay. it, and I've had success. Um, I think it's the what, wild rocket. Is that the variety? Yeah. Molly? I think I got uh -huh. my seeds from Molly. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I really like, like growing that. Um, and then of course, Georgia collards. So. Yeah. So <laughs> Dan love Danielle and Molly are greens girls. It sounds like. So. <laughs> Matt Lawler, what, what uh, is something that you've enjoyed growing the last little bit that gives, uh, you've had success with? Um, so one that comes to mind for me is uh, kohlrabi. Um, what is so kohlrabi? I've seen that, never grown it. It's like a misshapen broccoli kind of thing. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, so, it, so it puts out some, some leaves, uh, like any collard green or uh, turnip green, uh, maybe a little bit more tender. Um, okay. Or even, you know, some people eat broccoli greens. So you, you could take that part and cook them like greens. And then you've also got kind of like a, um, a rounded stem um, that kind of forms at the top of the soil there. Um, and it's, uh, you can cut it up, uh, dice it up and, and use it in a bunch of dishes. Gotcha. Um, probably just a roughage. I, I doubt it has much nutritional value when it comes <laughs> yeah. to that stem portion, but um, it, it's a good filler. Okay, that's a definitely an unusual one. I may try some of that this year. So I would, I would, uh, I'll finish off my favorite that I've really enjoyed the last few years um, are the sprouting broccoli. So a couple of the cultivars are uh, burgundy is one I grew last year. It's a more purple one. So the, the sprouting broccoli is, you know, you're not, you're not getting that large traditional head at the top. Maybe it does make the one head at the top, but you're mainly after the side shoots that more or less uh, continuously sprout as long as you harvest them. So it's good for cut and come again gardeners, you know, those of us who, who garden in smaller spaces, it gives you sort of more bang for your buck as far as space goes. Another one, burgundy is the uh, purple one I've grown and the, the green one that I prefer is called Monflor, Monflor. But those are, those are all good picks, very fun. Um, so we've got a couple uh, of, of questions that are, we're sort of related to some we started, we did before. Um, and so we're, we're going to get to this one. Matt, uh, when should cabbage be planted? This is a very specific question. Since you're over there near Pensacola, when should cabbage be planted in Pensacola? Okay. Um, so it would be like September, October, okay. sometime around there when you get some cabbage. Yeah. Cabbage is pretty cold tolerant, right? Yeah. It's, it's a tough veggie. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I've had success with cabbage for sure. Um, and you don't have to start that particularly early. Yeah, Just, and I'd, I'd probably start with uh, trans, you know, I'd start my seeds indoors and, and move them out. Yeah. It'd be a little easier. Uh, gotcha. The main thing with them, I have noticed uh, with some producers is uh, you want a fairly good size uh, transplant cell. Um, you don't okay. want something too small. Vigorous little plant. Yep. Okay. Um, let's go... Let's go to uh, another question here for Molly. Uh, Molly, what are the best companion edibles for small to medium raised beds in the fall? Um, yeah, well, I, I kind of think of that kind of question in terms of, of how long it takes for certain crops to grow. Um, you know, in, in the spring, you know, you like to use some of your big broad leafed crops to cover up your soil and shade it and keep down the weeds and keep soil moisture. 
in the fall, I think more about, uh, let's say you have carrots, which take a really, really long time to grow. Um, it takes a long time for them to germinate. You might want to go ahead and put in some, some radish seeds uh, near your carrots because they only take three or four weeks. Gotcha. Um, and so you're kind of just using more spatial properties of your garden. Yeah. Um, another, you know, it's radishes are always a great thing to throw in just about anywhere, you know, when you're waiting for other crops to, to come up. Um, arugula, as Danielle mentions, you know, that's kind of crop that you can plant again at the base of a lot of your brassicas. And then as, as they're growing, you can thin them out and use the little baby arugulas in your salads. And then once they're about six inches apart, you know, you have the, the full plant that you can harvest from from that. Um, so really just thinking about short and long season and then using, you know, if you have a, a big tall crop, um, you know, putting that on the, the south side can give you some shade um, to the north. You know, that could be a good or bad thing, but you can use, the, use those kind of properties of your garden to your advantage. Gotcha. Um, so we've got a question from Facebook that we'll go ahead and get to. Um, and I'll start by tackling this one first. Um, so any, the question is any tips for building raised beds, the type of wood, depth and size. So I'll just tell you what I do. Um, mine are built out of pressure treated pine. You know, the modern pressure treated, pressure treatment methods do not uh, involve arsenic or creosote or anything like that. The chemicals are a lot less harmful. It's using copper, um, you know, just to prevent fungus from eating the wood, not really a, an issue as far as human health. So that's good. Um, as far as depth and size, um, four by eight seems to work well because you can work it from both sides. You can reach the middles um, and eight feet. You know, if you buy 12 foot boards, you can just kind of cut four feet off of each end, make you a box. So uh, the four by eight method works real well for me. I prefer the 12 inch depth. So buy a 12 inch board. It gives your, your more aggressive crops like okra and tomatoes and those big crops plenty of root depth while and, you know, it also gives you 12 inches of weed suppression. So there's very few weeds that are going to grow in the dark through 12 inches of soil. So I like that. Um, if any of you guys have a, a different method that you prefer, shout it out. Um, that that uh, sounds good. I mean, if you're, if you're growing with kids, you might want to make sure that even three feet. Um, yeah, for sure. Uh, what, what were you going to say, Danielle? Yes, I was the, the whip is definitely because we have three um raised bed gardens here and they are 10 by 10 and it's <laughs> yeah. gotta get all up in there and it's yeah, yeah it, so yes <laughs> but, i'll yeah, encourage that for beginners, yeah. for beginners i i always feel like they they don't think about the fact that you don't want to compact that soil and so how yeah. are you going to grow in the middle without stepping through your, your garden so it's a good point yeah. Yeah, so another consideration that I never had uh, before I got started with all of this is I'm not the person who in the middle of the summer is going to be out there keeping the grass and stuff down and I didn't have the resources at the time or the time or the inclination or whatever to put down, you know, rocks or landscape fabric in between. So I just let the grass grow and I put my raised beds, I have four of them, put them too close together to get a mower in there. So I go in there and constantly be weed eating. So Make sure uh, also if you're a, a you know a low maintenance gardener like myself, if you want to be able to mow, uh, that you leave plenty of space between those beds to work. Uh, just that that fallow ground, like Molly was talking. So that's that's a good point. Uh, let's do another Facebook question while we're here. I'll pose this to the group. Uh, we'll start with Matt. Is it a horrible idea to try to do a succession crop of tomatoes? So a second sort of double cropping tomatoes. What do you think? Um. I mean, I'm not going to say anything's a horrible idea, but, uh, <laughs> you know, there are so many diseases that are soil borne um, that especially affect tomatoes. I would, I would recommend, you know, at least trying to break up that back-to-back -to -back tomato planting with, with some sort of, I mean, even if it's a, a grassy crop that you, you plant for a, a month or, you know, at least a month, hopefully, but, uh, you know, uh, for some amount of time before you go in and, and plant something, uh, that would gotcha. go for, for most any, any vegetable species. Um, you don't, it's not ideal to, to plant something <laughs> back to back. <laughs> gotcha. But, That's good. Good answer. Um, so Molly, we'll go, go to this one. Hi, I'm a beginner gardener and I would like to learn about lettuce in the fall. 
thank you so much. So tell us a little bit about growing lettuce. Uh, yeah, lettuce is a great choice. Um, I would I would stick to the easier ones are going to be like your your leaf lettuce, your loose leaf uh, butter crunches do pretty well. I think you can see behind me. Yeah, uh, <laughs> looks like you've already got some going there. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's a, a butter crunch in there, a loose leaf, um, some kind of red uh romanish loose leaf type yeah. um but you know the the heading varieties tend to not do so well down here in the south um you know they just have more uh pest problems and they have a harder time really forming those heads so you know don't try to grow iceberg um but everything loose leaves especially in butter crunches you can just keep doing um like succession planting so unlike tomatoes maybe uh lettuce is a great one to keep planting every couple weeks, you know, and try different varieties. Some take longer than others. Some grow, they take up more space, some don't. Um, you can mix up your salad man. bowl with greens and reds. So yeah, yeah there's uh, there's short ones too. There's a little, little gem is a great like quick variety um, and do some experimenting. There's all kinds of stuff that grows really well here. Yeah, you're, you're right on the leaf lettuce. Like that's like gardening difficulty level one, like. <laughs> If you struggle with leaf lettuce, you, you might need to reevaluate what's happening or come talk to your local extension. Agent. So Matt, kind of along those lines, uh, tell us about some varieties, uh, some more varieties of lettuce that you think people could be successful with. Okay, well, I would agree with Molly. I mean, you can't go wrong with pretty much any of the, the bib type or uh, the loose leaf type lettuces. Uh, there's hundreds of varieties out there of those. Uh, also, a, a lot of the romains do just just fine here. Um, one that I would mention that's more of kind of a, it's a semi-heading sometimes, um, or it's just kind of a loose leaf. Uh, there's a whole line of lettuces uh, that fall under Salanova type. Oh, yeah. Um, and, um, and, and the advantage there is that they grow, the, the, like I said, it's kind of a blend between a, a small head and a loose leaf. And um, all the leaves on them are, are fairly similar in size, so chefs like them. Um, and you can go in and, and you can kind of cube or uh, quarter your lettuce and, um, and you've got, you know, an instant salad. You don't have to go in and, and cut every leaf, um, you know, real fine. Um, More or less a one cut another, salad there. Sure. Um, and we'll, we'll post a, a publication about growing lettuce in high tunnels or greenhouses. Okay. And um, and what they were doing with that research was looking at what kind of heat tolerances lettuces could take. Uh, so if they they had them as a fall or a, a winter crop indoors, and then they they extended that into the spring. Um, so that would be something else important to look at. You know what kind of lettuces you know can handle a little bit longer season um, can grow throughout some of the heat. Gotcha. Yeah, I'll give a lettuce cultivar that I tried for the first time two years ago, I think. So this will be my third year with the seed is a little red romaine, a mini called Esbruke or Esbruke. I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's E-Z-B-R-U-K-E. -E. Man, that's a good little lettuce. It's so small. You can plant so much of it. It doesn't take up much room. Um, I had some that actually reseeded out of my vegetable garden in my soil Um below the raised bed and it just kept going and I kept harvesting it uh, until it got too hot. Great little lettuce, um, but those are all great. Uh, let's go to a Facebook question here. Um, again, Matt, since you're in Pensacola, did Brussels sprouts grow well in Pensacola? Seems like we got a lot of Pensacola people. <laughs> sure. Uh, I will say that I have never had success growing Brussels sprouts. Um, uh, a lot of times they'll grow those more in some of the, the western states um, where they, they get some good cold snaps. Well, they all, they, they stay <laughs> cold. Uh, but uh, there is, and maybe we can find the, the research, but there's some research out of University of Georgia where they're trying to promote Brussels sprouts as an alternative crop to cabbage and some of the okay. traditional crops grown in the southwest Georgia. So. Gotcha. Yeah, what was it, Molly? The veg heads in our in our extension garden have had success with Brussels sprouts, but I have never tried to grow them. But I went out there and they were the most beautiful Brussels sprouts I ever saw growing in our garden. Okay. So 
Yeah, your mileage may vary on Brussels sprout. We talked about the leaf lettuce, like gardening difficulty level one, Brussels sprouts, you're, you're raised at several degrees of magnitude for sure. And it is a much longer term crop than some of our other um, yeah. crucifer it takes type a while. crops. So I think that's what we run into trouble with. Yeah, very good. Um, Danielle, we haven't forgotten about you. What can we grow in a raised bed that might have some root knot nematodes? Yes, nematodes. So um, for those of you that don't know what nematodes are, there are several different species we have in Florida, but they are microscopic round worms um, that live in the soil and they feed on the plant roots um, of many, many crops. Um, root knot nematodes are kind of the most widely recognized ones. Um, they have they cause a galling on the roots. Um, and some of the common crops that you might see this on would be um, like tomatoes, pepper, um, okra for sure, a watermelon, um, squash, potato sweet potatoes, the, the, the list goes on. Um, and so a lot of times the plants will look very sick. They'll either be yellowing or wilting. Um, and then you can pull up the actual plant and look at the roots and you might find a gall on the root galls on the root um, the, where the, the nematodes are, you know, taking out nutrients um, from the plant. Um, but the biggest key, you know, to dealing with nematodes is um, crop rotation. Um, we've talked about that a lot. It's been mentioned several times today. Um, basically, um, you know, plants that are in the same plant, uh, plant family are subject to a lot of the same different pests and diseases. So by planting the same things over and over again, you're not giving those um, pests a chance, you know, to go to, to not have something to feed on. There's constantly something for them to feed on. Um, so in the case of, you know, what's a plant for uh, root knot nematodes, um, um, a lot of our cool season um, vegetables that are in the brassica family. So broccoli, call, um, cauliflower, uh, our mustard greens um, aren't as susceptible to um, root knot nematode. So the nematodes don't prefer to feed on these types of crops. Um, and so that is um, something that you can plant, but you can also, we've talked about uh, cover cropping. Um, so, you know, if you don't want to plant, you know, a cash crop, what we would call in your garden, garden, you could plant something, you know, like a Bermuda grass, or I think um, marigolds, uh, French marigolds have been shown to um, help with root knot nematodes. Um, and, the and then, and they're, yes, and they're pretty. Um, and then for like, a, that would of course be like a summer. Um, but for the winter, um, something like cereal rye as a cover crop might help. Um, but um, it does take time to reduce their populations. Um, it's not going to be, you know, overnight, so it might be two growing seasons. Um, and then, of course, there are root knot resistant uh, varieties um, that you can plant. Um, so when you are looking for seed, um, you might find something on the label that says VFN. So um, on the um, label of the seed. Right. And so that the V stands for verticillium wilt, the F stands for fusarium wilt, and N stands for uh, root knot nematode. And so these okay. are different um, resistant genes to that um, specific uh, so nematode. So you would look for that N on the um, seed packet. So if you're like me and you, you planted uh, the, the apparent nematode magnet okra, and just got devastated. Like, yeah. My okra was struggling. I pulled it up and there's just like the root nodule knots, the nodules all over it. And I'm like, okay, that's what's going on. So I could follow my summer okra crop up with the brassica and probably do okay. Right. Or you could use solarization right now because it's so hot out and solarized. So that's another way. But yeah, actually um, at the research, some of the research centers, um, whenever they're doing nematode research, they will actually plant okra to oh, increase <laughs> root not even so populations so okay. yes yes oh yeah that's something to watch out for molly would add in more compost could that help just like increasing that organic matter or the, can the nematodes still persist 
Um, I mean, yeah, adding more compost, I feel like is always, you know, a good idea yeah. to improve the organic matter content of your soil. Um, you know, it doesn't mean that it's going to take care of your nematode problem. Gotcha. So it's, you know, it's okay. I would think it's more the things that Danielle said. And I did see in the chat that uh, to add some some examples of brassicas. So that when we say brassica, we mean, you know, the collards, the kale, um, maybe radishes and turnips are in the brassica family. So it's it's referring to a plant family. Gotcha. Okay, uh, very good. We'll move through a couple more here. Uh, Molly, which vegetables are easiest to grow in small container gardens? So what can we grow well and not take up a lot of space? Um, okay, yeah. So what, well, first to keep in mind that a lot of our crops, you know, especially say your kale, your tomatoes, they're going to need enough space. So something like that, you're going to want to grow in at least like a three to five gallon bucket. Um, yeah. But some of our uh, shorter rooted varieties, um, you know, radishes, turnips, lettuces are going to grow really well in um, small container gardens. Um, but even those, you just want to make sure you're giving them, you know, if you look at the, the seed packet and it tells you how far away they should be spaced, uh, keep that in mind when you're putting them in your container garden. So. You know, you could even have a just a one gallon container, but you don't want to pack it full of, say, 30 radishes. You still want to make sure they have, um, you know, one or two inches between each plant. So if you just follow the spacing and give it, you know, most most crops are going to have most of their roots in the top six to eight inches. Uh, it's not to say that there won't be roots that extend further, uh, but just keep that in mind when you're you're planting a container garden. OK, cool. Matt, we've got sort of a philosophical question here. Um, and we know you're the guy for that sort of thing. What is the difference uh, between cauliflower and cabbage leaves? So we sort of interpreted this question, I think, as why do people not really eat broccoli and cabbage leaves, but we eat leaves from a lot of the other brassicas, as Molly just defined for us? Sure. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't know why people wouldn't eat that, but um, <laughs> I've eaten broccoli and cauliflower, uh, and you know the outer cabbage leaves, uh, they they cook up just fine. Okay. Um, sometimes you can even use them raw, uh, just depending on the dish. Um, I did. Uh, I think we will post a, a little article about kale. Uh, we've talked about kale a lot, but it, it's you know it's uh, that article kind of talks about some different recipes and things that certainly would be fine to use uh, for uh, broccoli. I'd prefer broccoli leaves or cauliflower leaves over cabbage leaves myself <laughs> just okay. because cabbage just seems I like coleslaw that's about it <laughs> when it comes okay. to, to cabbage. fair enough yeah so I guess a part of the reason why broccoli and cauliflower, uh, cauliflower leaves aren't found is because we need those leaves to drive production for the fruit which is primarily what we're going for is the flower you know stalks right in the stores sure. maybe that's why you don't see them sold commercially but as Matt says they're but, uh, good to eat yeah, and I mean, once you get that initial cutting of, of broccoli or, or cauliflower, I mean, it, it will shoot up some additional uh, sprouts, right. but you, you could, you know, go in after and, and collect some of the leaves then. Awesome. Being efficient with our gardening there. Uh, so sure. switch gears from vegetables a little bit, Molly. Talk about uh, some of the best herbs we can grow as the weather starts to cool down for us. Uh, sure, yeah. So herbs, um, you know, most of our herbs really do like cool weather. So that's one advantage we have, I think, in, in North Florida is, you know, maybe in the real, real high up states where it gets really cold, they have to think about, you know, making sure that a lot of their, their perennial herbs are going to survive through maybe really cold weather. Here, uh, the cold weather, we grow our best herbs, uh, maybe with the exception of, say, say, basil that doesn't like cold weather. Uh, but, um, you know, you have your perennials like rosemary um, grows, grows really well through the winter. Just make sure you don't overwater it. Um, sage uh, is another one. Thyme, um, oregano, they all grow well here and, and especially in the winter. Um, and then there's, say, cilantro, parsley, more of your, your annual types. Um, cilantro is a great one. It's easy to, to grow in the fall and you can even save the the seed really easily let it let it go to flower and then the seeds will dry and you know what a a cilantro seed is called it's coriander uh, coriander right yeah 
<laughs> right. So you can use your seeds in cooking um, as coriander, or you can go ahead and just take them dried off the plant and grow them the next year. So of all kinds of herbs we can grow. Yeah, that's that's cool. Yeah, the, the coriander little trivia is fun. That's one that I, I came fairly late to the party too. I always remember when I was a kid and uh, the first time I found out that uh, pickles were just cucumbers, I was like, you know, just mind exploded there. I was like, what? So anyway, uh, so kind of along those lines, Molly, the ones that uh, that might be a little cold sensitive, how should we overwinter those guys? Um, I mean, so if you're if you're trying to overwinter basil, you better hope we have a real a real mild winter. <laughs> right. um, the other ones, you know, it's it's more about, you know, some of the perennials you might want to have like then they're in their own bed. Um, so it's not taking room in your annual, you know, vegetable garden. Gotcha. You know, and then I, there's not much you really have to do. You know, of course you want to make sure they have, um, they still have uh, good soil, good drainage. Um, you know, if you have, we have a big drought, make sure they get some water. Other okay. than that, most of them are going to be pretty cold hardy. You know, they're, they're perennials, which means they have to they have to keep surviving throughout the year. So they, there's not too much you have to do. So they don't need a lot of help. That's that's the kind of plants that I like right there. <laughs> so we've got a couple of more questions that have that have floated into us, and we'll get to. Um, so Matt, we'll come to you. Hello again. Uh, second second from from this lady how long after saving my heirloom cherokee purple tomato seeds can i plant them again thank you so much so do they need some time uh, just after you harvest them or can you just go ahead and plant them okay so um with uh tomato seeds uh the the, the gel that's kind of in the in the inner part of the tomato where you got hollow spaces right um so right. that's like a locule gel and um what that substance is there for it's not for us to eat i mean it's not going to hurt you to eat it of course uh but it, it's there to, to keep the the seeds from sprouting while the tomato is on the vine um and ever so often you'll, you'll get a tomato and you'll have sprouts sticking out of it um if something goes haywire with that that internal system of a tomato um but uh you know, a lot of times with tomatoes, uh, people will, will soak the seeds uh, straight out of the tomato in some, some liquid um, and just allow them to ferment a little bit before they do uh, pull off that, that gel right. um, and, then, and then dry the seeds. Um, it's important that, that you keep them, you know, in a fridge, uh, 40 degrees or so, uh, if you are going to store them for an extended period. But as far as how long they'll, they'll last, I mean, I've had some 10 year old seeds and, and they've come up pretty much close to the germination rate that they're listed on the, on the seed package. So gotcha. uh, tomatoes, as long as they're stored, right, they, they seem to hold up pretty well. Um, and then, if, you know, if you are saving your own, uh, as long as you follow those, those few steps and then, then you should be good to go. Okay. Um, Danielle and Molly, uh, we talked about uh, sort of improving the health of the soil and cleaning out quote unquote diseases of the soil. So here's a question. Um, what types of plants would you suggest to help support the health of the soil or to help clean out any disease in the soil? I've heard that sunflowers are a good choice, but what else may be good for this? And I think y'all touched on this, especially Danielle with the marigolds and different cover crops, but could y'all tell us what might be a good choice to sort of get that soil back where they want it? Um, I guess it would depend on what your main problems are. Um, but of course, our legumes, um, like our clovers and things, fix nitrogen back into the soil. Yeah. Um, so those yeah. would be um, good. Uh, but I, I guess it would just really depend on what um, you're dealing with and what your biggest um, pests are and what, you know, what your overall goal would be, I would yeah. say. Yeah, it definitely depends on what the individual problems are, but if fertility is a problem, those legumes in the winter can really help. Molly, you got any thoughts you want to add to that one? Um, well, I was just thinking about the sunflowers. Um, you know, I, I think of sunflowers as a really great trap crop. Um, so yeah. I know if you if you grow your sunflowers in the spring a little ahead of your, your tomato crop, um, stink bugs love sunflowers and they favor them over tomatoes. So, you know, you have to make sure that you actually have a, 
a sunflower that's ready to, you know, having right. things, so you're not far behind. Um, but then you can kind of help to keep the stink bugs, which are really hard to control, you know, they'll, they'll stay on the sunflowers. Um, but yeah, as far as like fertility, um, cover crops is, are going to be your best bet as far as what you can grow to help improve your soil. Um, and then of course, all the, the stuff we mentioned at the beginning about erosion control and, and soil moisture and pollination and all that. Right. Well, we've got, a, we've got another minute or two here. So we'll run through a couple of questions that have filtered in through Facebook. Thanks to Matt Orwat uh, for, for taking care of those for us. So Molly, we'll stick with you. I keep reading about tomatoes through the winter for here. Um, I'm in Fort Walton, so near the coast or right on the coast. So do you have any experience in overwintering tomatoes? Is that worth it? Um, I mean, I, I guess if you grew tomatoes in like a greenhouse or a high tunnel setting, uh, you could maybe grow them in the winter. I have not ever done it. Um, okay. You know, I, I think it's because tomatoes, if you're just in a, a typical uh, ground or raised bed situation, you, you probably don't want to have, you know, tomatoes growing too frequently um, just for, you know, a lot, they, they do harbor a lot of different diseases. Yeah, um, yeah. But, you know, they, they, they can't take cold weather. So if you are going to try to grow them in, in the fall and winter, you're going to have to have some kind of protection system um, to support them or else they will suffer in the cold weather. So Matt Lawler, you've got a little bit of a uh, high tunnel experience. So could you overwinter tomatoes if you had a system similar to that, if you wanted to? Yeah, I mean, you might need to add the addition of a heater um, and okay. make sure you size it right, depending on your, your tunnel. Um, but, you know, that's what they do in commercial greenhouse crops, um, they'll, they'll just kind of lay the, the vines almost on the ground or on the ground in a greenhouse um, and cut off, you know, lower majority or the lower leaves of the, off the vine and um, just kind of wrap it around itself. Um, yeah. And then just have the, have the, the last five feet or so that they'll, that they'll trellis up. Um, vertically. Um, okay. It's definitely, definitely possible. If, if Can you got be done. Space. <laughs> A lot of space required. So very good. Um, so Matt, we'll stay with you on this one. I have a covered above ground veggie system. So I'm assuming they mean they use row cover. It keeps bugs and weeds out, but do I need to be concerned about pollination with it covered? Um, so, I mean, if, if it's, if it's somewhere, something that you could open during the middle of the day, then I, I wouldn't worry about pollination. Um, okay, but if they keep it know, open all uh, the time, they're going to have problems. Yeah, and I mean it would depend on what what the actual product is that's covering it. If it's a clear product um, and it's allowing for some sunlight to come through, and then they do allow for the ends to be open, then the pollinators will be fine. But okay. uh, it, it might confuse them a bit if it is um, more of a, a shade cloth material, um, just because they, they'll think it's cloudy and they might not want to work in there quite as much. Gotcha. Molly, I see the wheels turning. Yes, Adam. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, and um, and if, if it's a fruiting crop like say squash or zucchini or something, they do they depend on insect pollination. So yeah. um, like Matt said, if it's if it's open and they can get in, or if you can open it partially during part of the day, then the pollinators can get in. But if it is closed, then if it's you know, something like tomatoes are a little more self-fertilized, um, but squash, zucchini, uh, those kind of crops do uh, depend on insects to come in unless you're going to do it by hand. Um, so you're going to have to allow them to get in at some point. So it really does depend on the crop. Awesome. Very good. So uh, Molly and Danielle, we'll let the ladies handle this one, Matt. How do you control pickle worms? We're growing hydroponic cantaloupes and our crop was destroyed. Y'all have experience with pickle worm? So um, I answered a question about root knot nematodes earlier and um, I failed to mention that there are actually also beneficial species of nematodes and we call mm -hmm. those beneficial species of nematodes entomopathogenic nematodes okay. um, and there I actually I'm gonna tie into another Facebook I, there was a Facebook comment that said somebody ordered beneficial nematodes to deal with the bad guys and they helped with so many pests this year. Um, somebody wrote that in on Facebook and that's what I would suggest for pickle worm. Okay. Um, a lot of the different um, 
insecticides that we would have to control, um, you know, can be harmful to our pollinators. Um, and so, you know, with our curherbits, that's pollination is really important. And the, the time that we would need to treat um, to kind of go hand in hand. Um, and then also a lot of times by the time you see the damage, they're already, you know, in the rind or, you know, in the yeah. fruit. So um, using, you know, an insecticide might not work because um, obviously not making contact or it might be too late. So I would suggest the endomopathogenic nematodes. Okay. Um, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe Molly's got some more experience or different things that she's done. Pickle worms can be tough. Um, you know, it's, it's if a lot of uh, caterpillar type problems, you could try BT. Um, so that's the Bacillus thuringiensis. Uh, you know, it's a bacterial um, insecticide. So that's something that you know that the actual caterpillar does have to eat it has to digest um, the bt for it to work um and it can be a little bit more challenging with pickle worms as opposed to say uh your your regular like ar army worm that might be on say your tomatoes yeah. um and you're so you're gonna have to you know apply it that it is safe for pollinators it really only affects caterpillars so um you know all the other type of pollinators out there will be will be okay and you do want to apply it, you know, more frequently and at night because uh, it breaks down in the sunlight. And it can be tough to treat uh, pickle worms with BT. It's just a challenge. You have to really make sure that they eat the BT itself. So if you've got pickle worms in your fruit, you're uh, you may want to be thinking about for next season anyway, uh, Danielle's method, and go with some uh, some, you know, what was the word, Danielle? Intimopath. Entomopathogenic nematodes. I was close. I was, I was in the ballpark. So some of those things, uh, that would be great. My problem with cantaloupe this year, I had a uh, big wood rat that got into some mature cantaloupe uh, in some tall grass, but luckily my miniature poodle got him. <laughs> <laughs> Flushed him out and the dogs got him. So that was, I used the, uh, the dog control for, for my um, so a final question before we get out of here, we're running a few minutes over. I appreciate everybody for staying with us. Um, I'll just kind of pose this question to the group. So what are some garden jobs? What are the things that you're looking to do in the months coming up? Uh, August, September, October, uh, in the yard and mainly in the garden as we're talking about here. So we'll start with Molly up there in the top left here on my screen. Okay. Yeah, well, um, as I mentioned earlier, I love fall. So this is the, the time to be out there. I mean, it's your, this is kind of the best time for us, I think, to, you know, we don't have a little bit less pest problems in October, November. Um, it's a time to be seeding. Uh, you might have some, some cool season weeds that might be starting to pop up. Um, you know, right now I have chamber bitter still coming up a lot in my, my garden. So yeah, talking yeah. about maybe August, September, it's still going to be a lot of weeding. Um, but around middle of August, September, really start getting the, those seeds into their containers. Um, and then you can start doing some direct seeding, making sure that you have good fertility in your garden. Maybe go ahead and get a, a soil test if you hadn't gotten one in a while. Um, this is the fun time. Let's see. It's starting to <laughs> better outside by the time we get into to October so there you go Matt what are some things that uh that you should that folks should be looking to do in the fall in the garden okay uh so you know just starting with now uh, I think we'd want to think about cleaning up uh what might be growing in the in the garden um getting things you know killing them down or or tilling them under uh getting your soil prepared uh, you can go ahead and send off that that soil sample, if you hadn't done that in a couple of years, um, seeing where your pH is. And then also, if you want to go ahead and get the full nutrient analysis and um, see if anything that you've put into the garden that has benefited that, that soil over the time. Um, yeah. Might also want to think about uh, building a small greenhouse or uh, a small <laughs> cold frame or something like that uh, so yeah. that you can kind of extend the, the season of your, uh, your crops. Yeah, that's going to be something I'm doing this year is going to be adding a, uh, a little mechanism to add sort of a cold frame and put some put some cloth over my raised beds because last year my, my year got cut a little short because I had left town for the weekend and we got a frost and you know what happens next. So, uh, Danielle, is there anything you'd like to add to that that you like to be doing in the fall? 
Um, well, I just recently bought a new house. So this fall, Ooh. I will be actually doing some site selection and right. trying to figure out where I even want to put my garden. Because right now I've just been got my little containers, um, been yeah. container gardening. So I will be soil sampling, um, <laughs> finding a location, and then I will be making sure that I have some irrigation because where I think I want to put my garden, I don't have irrigation. Um, so I need to work on that, getting it out there. Um, yeah. And yeah, I think that's a lot of what I will be working on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and coming up with a plan too, you know, what I want to plant um, and when yep. I'm going to plant it as well and making sure I write it down. There you go. Um, so that's all great. There's, they've, these guys are giving y'all a lot of uh, ideas and things to do um, and, and how to be successful. I do, before we want to get out of here, um, I want to advertise our next, um, our next Gardening in the Panhandle Live is in a couple of weeks on August the 6th, um, and that's going to be an open-ended Q&A, uh, so I'm kind of scared of this, um, you know, this, <laughs> this is anything you want to ask, um, ideally it would be horticultural related uh, to the yard or garden, turf grass in some way, you know, we're, we're not paid, you know, marital counselors or anything like that, but, uh, you know, as far as your yard and garden questions go, bring us anything uh, next, in two weeks on August the 6th, we're going to have a, a great group of panelists for you. Um, I think I will be back here. Our, our behind the scenes crew is going to be there. And we invite you to go ahead and register for that when you see uh, the registration come out here in a couple of days. So make sure to do that. We had a couple of questions uh, that were kind of thrown in at the end uh, that I just went ahead and slotted into that open Q&A. Um, just that didn't fit real well here. So if we didn't answer something today, I would just uh, I want you to know I went ahead and put it in there because it fit a little better. Um, so if you've got a question that we didn't get to today or, you know, just an off the wall horticultural question that you've always wanted to know the answer to, save that for August the 6th. Um, and as always, be sure to check out our survey that we have associated with this. Those of you who registered via Zoom, I um, want to give a special thank you uh, shout out to our great panelists. One of the best discussions we've had so far, I think. Danielle, Molly, Matt did a great job. Uh, behind the scenes seemed to work fairly smooth. I appreciate Matt Orwat, Beth Bowles, and Julie McConnell uh, for keeping us straight behind the scenes um, and making our, the, making our feed on Facebook happen. Uh, so I hope you guys have a successful fall gardening season. Um, if you have any more questions related to this um, or you uh, you run into issues as you go into the fall garden season, ask your local extension agent, um, you know, stop by the office if you can, if they're open and accepting visitors. Um, if not, at least give them a call or shoot them an email and we'll be happy to help you. So uh, any parting comments from the group before we get out of here? Thanks for being such a great moderator, Daniel. Oh, You're thank awesome. you, Daniel. <laughs> all right. Yeah, so, all right, Matt, what you want to leave us with today? Any, any thoughts from Santa Rosa County? Oh, just uh, thank everybody for joining us. Um, we're getting a little rain. I hope everybody gets a little bit, not a whole lot, but it's nice to yep. have. That's right. We'll take it where we can get it. All right, folks, y'all have a good rest of your day and a great fall gardening season, and we'll see you right back here on August the 6th. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>